tonight, amazing stories of survival from a terrifying plane crash. Yeah. It's a bigger. What went wrong and what went right for so many to survive this? Gunshots, a chase, and a day-long standoff in a busy Toronto neighborhood. It's like you have a beautiful Monet, and then you point, you paint these lines across the Monet. Next week, major changes are coming to the night sky. Why scientists are sounding the alarm. The Force will be with you. And the latest Star Wars flicks, latest controversy, sidelining a groundbreaking character. This is The National. Beck Air Flight 2100 was in trouble at takeoff. Within moments, it plunged to the ground. The fuselage of the Kazakh airliner crumpled and torn like tinfoil. At least 12 people are dead, but there were 98 people on that plane. Carolyn Dunn's story of disaster tonight is also one of survival. A dramatic rescue of a baby boy discovered cradled in the arms of his injured mother. Amazingly, not the only story of survival. I was sitting next to emergency exit. Aslan Nazareliev says from his seat, he felt the plane first sway, then vibrate violently. Screaming, kids are crying. Only a sound of people panicking in the plane. The Fokker 100 commuter plane crashed, first into a concrete fence, then a two-story house. Nazareliev says many seated around him in the wreckage were dead, but not all. We were lighting the cell phone lights, so helping out each other, so because there was a high risk of uh, fire. Fortunate experts agree that the wreckage wasn't ignited by highly combustible jet fuel. The low-cost commuter flight was taking off from Kazakhstan's largest city, Almaty, to its capital. The fatal flight would last only 19 seconds. And now authorities are left to piece together what went wrong. Kazakhstan's deputy prime minister revealed the plane's tail touched the runway twice during its takeoff attempt. Aviation expert Phil Seymour explains that could indicate the pilot was trying to adjust. And potentially that they could pull the, the control wheel back uh, so far that it causes a tail strike of the aircraft. Investigators will examine whether human error or mechanical failure played a role. Another possible clue? Survivors say the wings were icy when they scrambled out of the downed plane. Perhaps the black box recording reportedly recovered will solve the mystery. But one thing is already clear. It looks like it was very lucky that, that a lot more casualties didn't occur here. The dozens who survived this brush with death would surely agree. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, London. To some news here at home, Winnipeg was on track for a new homicide record for much of 2019, and it's well over that terrible line now after a killing on Christmas Day. This is the 43rd homicide of 2019. Terrible year for, for the city. And that 43rd homicide, a man police found collapsed on the sidewalk who later died of his injuries. Gang involvement is suspected. Winnipeg's previous sad record was 41 homicides set in 2011. And there is another Winnipeg death that really rattles today. Only we don't know yet what happened to 26-year-old Kelly Fraser. It's the measure of her short, impressive life people across this country are thinking of. Her nook versions of pop hits got noticed, her own songs got a Juno nod, and her work in remote corners of Canada's north changed lives. Karen Pauls has the reaction to that loss and that legacy. As he sits in his Ottawa music studio, Thor Simonson still can't believe Kelly Fraser is gone. It's an enormous loss. <laughs> Simonson produced Fraser's Juno-nominated album, Sedna, but he was more than a producer, he was her friend. She was a beacon of hope for many. Uh, she gave voice to her people, many who couldn't uh, speak. She spoke for them. Simonson and Fraser did workshops in remote communities, teaching songwriting and music production skills to young people. It was her, her life vision was to, uh, to inspire other young Inuit to follow their dreams. 
As news of Kelly Fraser's death spread, friends and fans were shocked and devastated. Senator Murray Sinclair described her as one of our young heroes with an important message for young Indigenous women and girls. The loss of Kelly is a huge loss. Rhonda Head is a Cree musician who met Fraser at the Banff Centre for the Arts last month. Her most inspiring message for uh, that I believe was singing in her own language, in her Inuk language. Just last year, Fraser received an Inspire Award for using pop music to strengthen Inuit culture and language, and for sharing her personal struggles with substance abuse and her father's suicide. Now I want to make music that young people will listen to because they're the ones that are in pain. They're the ones that need strength. Fraser's cause of death hasn't been confirmed. She was working on a third album called Decolonize, which was set for release in 2020. And I believe that this country and this whole world needs to hear my music so we can heal together. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Police have an armed suspect in custody after a long standoff north of Toronto. An adult male was brought out of a home in handcuffs after barricading himself inside for most of the day. About an hour before that, he, before he was brought out, loud bangs were heard across the neighbourhood. Lisa Shing has been following that story all day, and so here is how the drama unfolded. Guns drawn, York Regional Police surrounded this house in a quiet suburban community. As the hours passed, the crowd grew. Canine units, tactical teams, negotiators and helicopters. It all started around the corner at this gas station around 10.30 this morning. An officer made a routine traffic stop here. The driver started shooting at him with what police believe was a handgun. I just hear a bunch of loud bangs. To be honest, I wasn't sure what it was, but I look outside, I see a... Uh, unmarked uh, police like police car pull up right in front of the shop he's holding an assault rifle and then i see uh i see this green or beigeish greenish uh, suv pull out of the gas station just speeding down the road police say the suspect fired at and damaged several other cars in the process fortunately the officer was not injured and uh, fortunately there were no injuries to anyone else in the community for something like this where we do have a suspect who was willing to actually fire uh, shots in the middle of the day in a very busy crowded area. Um, that's a very dangerous and concerning type of situation. The man drove to this house and barricaded himself alone inside. Police did not say whether he lives there. As they tried to negotiate his surrender, they evacuated some houses nearby. One resident we spoke with by phone saw police move in. And then there's a few men right in the house in front of us. So I assume that they're looking at a house from different angles. My dog has been freaking out. She's whining and stuff and pacing because she knows something's wrong, right? Um, and then my boyfriend and I were just kind of observing. I, I am in shock that it was right near my house, that I have such a clear view of it. So, Lisa, you're outside that house north of Toronto. What did you see? Well, Adrian, shortly before 11 p.m. Eastern, we saw police take out who we think is the suspect in handcuffs. He was wearing a white T-shirt and was taken away. And a little while before that, we heard several loud bangs coming from the house. We also saw the tactical unit uh, breach the house. And what we heard, uh, we thought, were gunshots coming from the house. And we also saw uh, a tear gas canister being thrown back at police. So a lot of action uh, to tonight and definitely throughout the afternoon as well. Uh, what we can tell you as well is that the Special Investigations Unit is investigating and it gets involved anytime police are involved in serious incidents like deaths or injuries. Adrian. All right. Thank you, Lisa. It's Lisa Shing at the scene of that standoff north of Toronto. To the United States now and troubling revelations about a former Navy SEAL who was granted clemency by the president. Eddie Gallagher was convicted of posing for a picture with a dead body. Earlier this week, the retired special operations chief and his wife posed for pictures of a different kind as guests of Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago. Now, in newly revealed testimony, we are getting a clearer picture of just what that honored guest might have done. Jacqueline Hansen reports. I think he just wants to kill anybody he can. 
disturbing, vivid claims made by Navy SEALs against their own platoon chief, Edward Gallagher. In your mind, is what happened that day and what happened with all these other incidents war crimes? Yes. In interviews with investigators, text messages, and body cam footage obtained by the New York Times, the SEALs claim Gallagher killed a captive, semi-conscious ISIS fighter. He just pulled out a knife and started stabbing him. Then they say he pressured his platoon to pose for a photo. The SEALs also allege he targeted women and children. If I saw Eddie take a shot at probably a 12-year-old kid. In a statement reported by the New York Times, Gallagher said he reacted to the videos with surprise and disgust and that the SEALs made up blatant lies about him. The claims led to multiple charges in 2018 against Gallagher. A military jury acquitted him of all but one. He was convicted of posing for the photo and demoted. But in a controversial move, President Trump stepped in and restored his rank. These are tough people and uh, we're going to protect our war fighters. I think the president's behavior in connection with this case and several others is beneath contempt. The president's involvement has been criticized for hurting the credibility of the military justice system. My hope is that the military justice system will emerge from this dark period, uh, not only intact, but uh, touch wood, the better for it. We don't know whether the president knew the details of the testimony when he made his decision, but his support for Gallagher hasn't wavered. And in an Instagram post yesterday, Gallagher made it clear that support is mutual. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Washington. Gallagher is just one case. Trump has intervened in the cases of three U.S. service members accused of war crimes. First Lieutenant Michael Behenna was convicted of murdering an Iraqi prisoner. Major Matthew Goldstein was charged with killing an unarmed Afghan civilian. They were both pardoned. Trump has intervened in other cases, often people who have supported him or appeal to his base. He pardoned Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio, convicted of criminal contempt, accused of illegally detaining Latinos in abysmal conditions. He also pardoned one-time Canadian Conrad Black, convicted of defrauding shareholders in 2007, also the author of a book called Donald Trump, a president like no other. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk is an inspiring figure to some, pretty polarizing to others. His latest plan is really no different. Starting next week, his company will launch thousands of satellites into space to connect the world. But as Sarah Levitt tells us, those hunks of metal could change how we see the night sky forever. Ignition. Liftoff. SpaceX is ramping up its satellite project. It's called Project Starlink, promising global high-speed internet access, cheap and available just about anywhere on the planet. Sounds like good news for many, except for space researchers. Because to make it happen next Friday, SpaceX will start sending 60 satellites into space every few weeks. So these things are sort of streaming by while we're looking at our galaxies and stars, and they leave these luminous trails. According to the United Nations, there are about 2,200 satellites orbiting Earth right now. If SpaceX has its way, there could be as many as 12,000 more satellites in space in the next five years. This Canadian astronomer says to see the galaxies she studies, sprawling systems of stars, interstellar dust and more, she has to look past those satellites. It's like you have a beautiful Monet and then you point, you paint these lines across the Monet. Um, you can still sort of see the Monet behind, but you're missing all the information that the lines are painting over. In Hungary, Gaspar Bakos has been looking at the sky from the Piszkestedo Observatory. We can see the universe, we're just so lucky and we're screwing this up. If space fills up with satellites, he says, the night sky as we know it will be gone. Imagine you sit down at a campfire and all you see on the sky is satellites trailing across and you can't even point out the Big Dipper to a kid. SpaceX says it's working with scientists to find solutions, including testing out paint that dampens the reflectivity of its satellites. For Wallet, the idea of internet access for all is a worthy cause, but not if it comes at the expense of our view of the universe. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal.
From a controversial battle over space to the latest controversy around Star Wars, the rise of Skywalker, Skywalker topped the Christmas box office this week. But the apparent fall of a lead character of color in the iconic franchise, practically erased from the narrative, has sparked a backlash. Salima Shivji has more on the sidelined star. As fans rush to see the new Star Wars film, excitement turned to disappointment for many. Not fighting what we hate, saving what we love. That a formerly prominent character is reduced to an afterthought. Rose Tico may have made it into the trailer for The Rise of Skywalker, but the character gets only slightly more than a minute of screen time in a movie that's more than two hours long. I would just say it's very obvious and kind of jarring, you know, if you've seen the previous one um, and how much she was uh, an integral part to the, the plot and just sort of the ideas and ideals of the movie. That shift prompted outrage on Twitter, a hashtag Rose Tico deserved better trending. Calls for a brand new series centered around her alone, bolstered by the director of Crazy Rich Asians, lauded for its nearly all Asian cast. To add insult to injury, it seems there were more scenes shot of Rose and the main hero cut from the final version. It was really cool just to have feminine energy on set. Oh man, I wish I could tell you more, but I'm really excited uh, for people to sort of see them interact. The actress who plays Rose Tico was the target of fierce racist and sexist harassment after the last Star Wars movie, so bad it led her to delete her social media presence. Some say sidelining her now looks like the Star Wars world capitulating to bullies. Even so, this latest controversy could actually reinforce calls for more meaningful change, even in long-running movie franchises. And so that is something that I think people will be looking at in the future, which is not just do you have non-white people in your cast, but are they being allowed to drive the story? Are they the protagonists or are they still supporting white leads? Questions that Disney and the other big studios are still grappling with. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Vancouver. The red rockets have been a part of Toronto's streetscape since the late 1800s. And with the new generation of streetcars rolling out, the last incarnation is being retired at the far too young age of 40. Olivia Stefanovic was among those taking one last ride. It's the end of the line for a part of Toronto's history. I miss seeing them around the city like this is what I grew up with. In the summertime with the windows open, best air conditioning you could ever have. The famed Cherry Streetcars inspired artists over the years. That art took many forms. I'm a TTC skedaddler, got a socket from a big red rattler. I got a but these big red rattlers, technically known as the Canadian light rail vehicles, would never have rolled without the advocacy of Steve Monroe. The group I was part of, Streetcars for Toronto, the reason these cars even exist was that we were successful in convincing the city and the TTC to save the streetcar system in 1972. Monroe rescued the cars from being swapped for subways. Since then, the city has grown and the Red Rocket often finds itself grounded in gridlock. There's a demand for much more intensive service on the downtown routes. Uh, by streetcars, service by streetcars. Street yeah. More than 300,000 people rely on them to get around every day. After four decades, these iconic streetcars are being replaced with a new, more accessible fleet. So the low-force streetcars are able to carry far more passengers, close to double, uh, versus the CLRVs. Bombardier is building the replacements for about $1 billion. A handful are late. But the Toronto Transit Commission expects all 204 will be cruising through downtown streets in the coming weeks. As for the retirees... We will preserve one or two of the streetcars and there are some other organizations that have also shown interest. Uh, there's an American uh, rail museum and there's also one here in Ontario that are interested in having some of those streetcars. Coming to a museum possibly near you, but not before one final trip down memory lane this weekend. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Toronto. More news still ahead on the national, including a California community charging a fee for disposable coffee cups. Is that a plan moving north? We're back in two minutes.
Welcome back. Here's some of the stories we're following tonight on The National. This is Julie Berman, a Toronto trans woman known for speaking out about violence against her community, and now she has become a victim, killed in an assault earlier this week. A 29-year-old man has been charged with second-degree murder. Oscar-winning director James Cameron can add a new honour to his list of accolades, the Order of Canada. Cameron will become a companion of the order, the highest of those honours. That's the same as former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. They're among the 120 recipients named today by Rideau Hall. It is possible you're thinking of your New Year's resolutions. Maybe going greener is on the list. It certainly seems to be on the list for Berkeley, California. Kim Brunhuber with the big change coming on January 1st that could spill over to Canada. How much would you pay for a cup of coffee? Not the drink, the cup. Here in Berkeley, it'll soon cost you 25 cents unless you bring your own or buy a reusable one and return it for a refund. I think it's a good start to try to like push people to go more green or, or go reusable. And this is a reusable... The espresso. politician who wrote the bill says, think of it as a carrot, not a stick. By showing people that there is a cost to the throwaway foodware, studies have shown that we can incentivize people effectively to bring their own. So why should Canadians care about a municipal ordinance in a small American town? Well, look no further than the plastic shopping bag. Cities in the Bay Area were the first to charge for them, then ban them outright. Just one of many environmental trends that started here and soon ended up in Canada. The same could happen with coffee cups. Within days, of the ordinance having been passed, we learned of other jurisdictions that were introducing either similar and in some cases identical legislation. This cafe in nearby Oakland has gone a step further. No one's drinking out of to-go cups because there aren't any. We had a problem reconciling the moral math of having paper cups that were going to uh, trash our lake, trash the neighborhood for transactions that were two minutes and three dollars. An outlier, sure, but also an early adopter. The massive coffee chain Blue Bottle, which uses 12 million paper cups a year, will phase them out by the end of 2020. So savor that paper cup while you can. One day, to go may be gone. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Berkeley, California. After the break, months of unrest and violence in Hong Kong. Some of the reporters who were there in the streets take us back. And later, our conversation with Margaret Atwood as she celebrated a big birthday. We're back in two minutes. One of the biggest international stories of 2019 happened in Hong Kong. What started as protests against a bill that would have allowed for extradition to mainland China quickly became a bigger push for more citizen rights. But things changed. Night after night, police and protesters clashed in the streets. There, too, were Sasha Petrasik and Chris Brown. And in our latest reporter's notebook, they look back on trying to stay safe while covering the story. Being in the middle of the protest started out being um, fairly benign, but uh, within a matter of weeks, certainly after the first couple of months of these protests, things really did become much more dangerous. Loads and loads of tear gas coming out, you can hear it popping. The protesters are trying to send it back, to throw it back, but that's not being very effective. There was tear gas flying, there were rocks being thrown, and in some cases, uh, firebombs by the protesters themselves. The police were becoming much more aggressive toward everybody, including journalists. So they were hitting people to get them out of the way with their clubs. They were firing tear gas canisters, in some cases at people's heads or certainly at that level. This turned into really a battle between protesters and the establishment and the police itself. And the society was just split right down the middle. So standing in the middle of it, you really felt that it was a war zone. Hong Kong streets turned white again as tear gas that burns the skin coated protesters who refused to take down street barricades. In an instant, you have to grab your gas mask and put it on and then make an instant decision about 
what do you do? We spent about two minutes inside the tear gas zone uh, and then we, we decided we had to get out of there because we could see that the police had water cannons. We could hear what sounded like rubber bullets being fired and in fact that's what it was. It's a very bad place to be. I think for us the scariest, most dangerous moment came one night in Kowloon. We saw this group of maybe 30 people or so up ahead and, and the police began to chase them. But just as they got close, from outside of, a, of an alley um, came another huge crowd, maybe three or four hundred people. One of the police officers fell. I thought he was going to get beat up, perhaps even killed. One of his colleagues pulled out his pistol and pointed it at the protesters and then fired up in the air. And at the time, that was the first use of live ammunition in this protest and it marked a serious escalation. It did, however, buy the officers enough time to get back on their feet and then to run down the road and they eventually locked themselves in a building and they had to wait for reinforcements to come. And this is where that very scary scene ended with the riot police taking shelter in this building here. It was striking to me how fast things changed, how unpredictable it was, and ultimately how, how very dangerous uh, it could have been. You know, describing Hong Kong and the situation there to Canadians uh, doesn't seem that difficult. They grabbed Chris Young yesterday. He's a Canadian who spent his teens in Vancouver, his adult life in Hong Kong. And last night, he spent chained to a hospital bed after a heavy-handed arrest. And they feel that they almost have a duty to explain what's going on there. So they help me tell Canadians that story. Some 300,000 Canadians call Hong Kong home and Global Affairs warns them to exercise a high degree of caution this holiday as those clashes are expected to last well into the new year. Between Monday and last midnight, we arrested altogether 336 people. Anti-government protesters vandalized businesses that are seen as pro-Beijing over the Christmas shopping season. They are vowing to return to the streets in force for a mass rally on January the 1st. Next on The National, our interview with Margaret Atwood. On the year she lost her partner, turned 80, and published another bestseller. And snow in the desert, a powerful storm hit Southern California. We'll be right back. Welcome back. There are some dangerous winter storms around the United States that are wreaking havoc on the roads and at the airports now as millions are heading home from the holiday. This is wonderful. This is like rash experiencing winter. All right, not everyone would call it wonderful, and it is not often that you see snow blanketing Southern California. This nasty storm has taken many by surprise there, unleashing the triple punch of flooding, strong winds and heavy snow. Meanwhile, there's an entirely separate winter storm in southwestern U.S. that is expected to barrel its way north here to Canada this weekend. And Environment Canada is already warning that the weather will rapidly deteriorate on Sunday afternoon in many parts of eastern and central Ontario. <laughs> And tens of thousands of protesters continue to flood the streets across India today, demanding the government repeal a controversial law that grants citizenship on the basis of religion. That law makes it easier for people of certain religions to become citizens, excluding Muslims. At least 23 people have been killed in nationwide demonstrations there in recent weeks. For decades, we have devoured her bestsellers and watched her fame spread throughout the world. Earlier this year, I sat down with Margaret Atwood, this remarkable woman who just keeps smashing through the benchmarks. It has, of course, broken a Canadian publishing record because it is, of course, The Testaments, Margaret Atwood's sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. Let's go! Hurry up! That book was turned into a hit dystopian TV series about a place called Gilead, which is the new name of a part of the United States after a fascist religious takeover. If I'm going to change things, I'm going to need allies. 
That series sparked so many questions from viewers and readers, the political era seemed so ripe. Atwood had to write the sequel, and in it, there's hope that the cruel, right-suppressing reign ends. This is more than a book release. This is a cultural moment. The world wanted this book. The frenzy is Harry Potter-esque. I'm very excited about it. I'm excited to see where she takes it. The two winners of the 2019 Booker Prize for Fiction. Atwood co-winning the British Literary Prize, The Man Booker. But the universe isn't always kind, and as if to counter the highs, it delivered a terrible low. Her partner and great love, the accomplished writer Graham Gibson, died in September in London, England, while he was with Atwood to celebrate her book launch. I am so honored to have you here. Well, I'm happy to be here. This she remains busy, England. maybe necessarily so, but she found time to talk at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library in Toronto. I think like a lot of Canadians, I've thought about you a lot in the last couple months, and, and I'm just wondering how you are. Pretty steady. Um, better for me to be out in pub public and keep on the road, but of course it was a shock, but we knew it was coming. So family was prepared. I think Graham himself pretty much knew that something like that was going to happen pretty soon. But we had a very nice 10 days before that happened. To be sitting in here is interesting, it's beautiful. I have to confess as someone who was born in the city, raised in the city, I I've never been in here before. And I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about the treasures that are in here that matter to you. Um, among the things that are in here are my papers, which I donate to them on a regular basis. So of recent months, people have been going through the boxes of newspaper and magazine clippings that I made at the time I was writing The Handmaid's Tale. So they're going back and looking at what might have influenced it, what might have prompted it, what might I, I have been putting into that book uh, from real life. When we talk about things that are in boxes in libraries, I have to confess being a, a bit enchanted with the idea of this manuscript that's in a Norwegian library. The future library of Norway. A forest got planted that will grow for a hundred years. In each year of those hundred years, a different author from around the world will put a secret manuscript, only two copies, into the future library of Norway. Be careful, it's the first <laughs> And in the hundredth year, the boxes will all be opened and enough paper will be made from the trees that will have grown to print the anthology of the future library of Norway. And people will still be able to read, and people will still be interested in reading. Those are a lot of hopeful things. So I won't be here. You think, maybe, yeah. they'll, maybe they will have some new technology by then. But could you throw a girl a bone? In nope. terms of what it's about? No, nope. oh, no, nope, 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 nope. You have to swear to secrecy. Uh, all I can tell you is it's made of words. On the Testaments, w when you read it, there's a, there's a, when I read it, there, there's a moment that I, I feel like I'm reading the newspaper a little bit. It, it's so familiar, you know. Is, is it making too much of a presumption to say that, that the kickstart there was the inauguration of, of Donald Trump? Uh, no, it started before then. Mm -hmm. But you could see it coming. And you could see the things that the Republicans had been saying in the two elections before that time the ones in which Obama won. And what are those things? Women should be subservient. Uh, if a woman is, is carrying a dead baby, she should just carry it until it comes out because they're like cows. Uh, it's not real rape if the woman has a baby because if it's real rape, her body shuts down. Tell that to Bangladesh. And just an appalling amount of ignorance. What is it about the book that, that made doing that important in the face of these sorts of conversations? For a long time, we seemed to be moving away from Gilead, especially in the 90s, right after the Cold War ended, and we were told it's the end of history, and now we'll all go shopping. And we did go shopping until 9-11. Mm -hmm. Yes, then it turned out there were other things to think about in addition to shopping. 
and then the financial meltdown, and when there's uncertainty and a certain amount of chaos, people get anxious uh, and frightened and are willing to trade certain civil liberties for somebody who will make the trains run on time. So that's what interested me, and it also interested me to go back into Gilead 16 years later and see how it might have begun to crumble, it being my belief that these things do ultimately crumble in some way. There's a lot that makes me smile uh, when I read the Testament. So one of the things is that Canada is sort of seen as a sanctuary, and, and that makes me smile because I think a lot of Canadians presume that's what their country is. and, and and then it isn't. Right. <laughs> uh, you're not going from imperfect land to perfect land. You're going from um, worse to less worst. Where do you see the fragilities in this country? I mean, you were on the road for a lot of the elections. Yeah. But did you hear language? Did you hear conversations or speeches that, that set off alarm bells for you? Oh, I think p things got somewhat less civil than they have been in past years. Uh, but that's been happening across the board and uh, certainly in the United States and, and England. Politicians have been talking in ways that once upon a time they never would have spoken in those ways. Mm -hmm. It would have been considered unstatesmanlike. Uh, but there's a big uh, signaler of that kind of vulgar language sitting in the White House. So it does set a tone. And does that tone flow north? You know what they say, when Washington has a cold, Ottawa sneezes. Of course it flows north. It is a one-way mirror that we're pretty much glued to. Mm -hmm. Some of the conversations that during the election I found kind of interesting because I think a lot of people thought uh, a, a woman's right to choose, uh, same-sex marriage, that these were settled issues in Canada. They're not settled issues. They're settled for now. They can always be reversed. Do you smell a backslide? In this country, not so much. You'll notice who did not win the election. Mm -hmm. So not so much, but enough that you should feel somewhat apprehensive. I noticed, I think we all saw uh, at the Man Bookers that you were wearing the Extinction Rebellion button. Yes, I absolutely was. And I w what draws you to this group in particular? Okay, this group it was started by young people. There's a lot of them. They have the power to move the political needle because any politician who can count must realize that soon this demographic will be voting. And if they pay no attention whatsoever to this planetary-wide event that is going to kill a lot of people and already has and may ultimately finish off the human race, if they're not going to pay any attention to that, this large block of new voters will not be voting for them. Who inspires you at the moment? I mean, this group is inspiring. It yes, it's, like. it's inspiring. But, but who else inspires you? Oh, how many do I have to pick? <laughs> then you'll <laughs> say, who nice else? And what about so them? Many. No, I don't, actually. Greta? Well, Greta Thunberg? Yeah. In fact, I just got her, her, little, her little bookie, which I'm about to read. Uh, yeah, she's very inspiring, and I love her answer to people who were pestering her about having Asperger's. She said, it's a superpower. <laughs> Good for her. I hadn't planned to ask you this, but, I, but I'm just, you're here, and I, I can't help it. This month for you, November in particular, I, I guess you have what... You mean I'm going to turn 80? Well, there's that. My friend's called a roundy birthday. Uh, a roundy birthday. It's a got round. a zero at the Correct. end. Correct. Yes. Uh, and I'm wondering if you at this age could pull a much younger you aside and say, look, I have a few minutes to let you know what's coming, what to watch for, what to enjoy, what I wish I'd been told. What would you tell her? What a weird question. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't get that chance. And, um, you know, part of living life is not knowing. If you knew everything, uh, it would be quite a different proposition. In fact, it would be number one more boring and number two more depressing is that anticipation of not knowing what's in the big box with the ribbon on top you know if you already knew it it wouldn't be fun your time as always is is hugely appreciated 
and thank you very much. Shortly after our interview, the Fisher Rare Book Library announced they will be displaying the original handwritten draft of The Handmaid's Tale. You'll be able to see it yourself between January and April of 2020. Time for a very quick break. When we come back, the science of music. What draws us to the same drum beats no matter where or who we are. Music seems to be one of the many things that bonds people this time of year, sometimes no matter who or where they are. That's not just about the season, it appears to be about science. Maybe it's about the rhythms of our heart or our lives, but a new study from Harvard confirms when it comes to how we understand music, we're more alike than different. Deanna Sumanek Johnson tells us how. This ensemble features performers from disparate musical traditions, but somehow they manage to write and play together beautifully. When I wrote my piece for the band, even though I'm from Mexico, I heard a sound from my colleagues from Iran and Pakistan that had a bit of a Spanish tone to it. When we start performing, they all were saying, I love your melody. Now there's a major Harvard study that says there's a reason they sound so harmonious. It looked at recorded music and descriptions of music in more than 100 societies around the world, including the Mentawai people in Indonesia. Sam Mayer headed the study. In the face of an enormous amount of diversity, uh, which makes music sound so interesting wherever you find it in the world, there are still deep regularities. Among the 14 common occasions where music is used around the world, expression of love for another person, lullabies for infants, and dance music. The study also found that there are strong similarities in speed or tone of songs that are used for the same purpose. So that means that people have some intuition when they hear a lullaby from a foreign culture, they have some intuition that that's actually a lullaby. That claim stirred up some controversy in the academic world, where it was long regarded each culture's music was as unique as a fingerprint. Certainly the Kune Orchestra members don't feel they can always accurately guess what their colleagues' native songs mean. Dimitri from Greece, and there's a Padida from Iran. Every time when I even hear their instruments or their songs, and even if it's a love song or, you know, like, it brings that heavy sorrow to me, you know. Sam Mayer says cultural misunderstandings do happen, but he still thinks the essence of his study tells us something positive. There's something sort of unifying about the fact that there are minds um, in each of these societies that are making the music that we're studying. Um, and there's something quite similar about the minds of many different societies. And in a world divided, that strikes the right chord for many people. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on the national, a fish feeding frenzy off the coast of British Columbia. It's a bit hard to say. What's attracting all these seagulls to the waterfront? Well, that's our moment. Next. If you live by the sea in White Rock, British Columbia, you have likely seen your share of fish. But not like this. Let's call it a slimy seafood storm, which means, of course, it's tonight's moment. That BC waterfront is neither bubbling nor boiling. It is, in fact, brimming with what's believed to be northern anchovies. Uh, I was visiting my mom for the holidays and taking the dog for a walk on the beach. Brock McLaughlin was gobsmacked when he took this video. Yeah, like it was like a holy S moment. Uh, I couldn't believe it because I've never seen something like that before. And everyone on the beach is so confused. The fish explosion is a predator's dream. Sea lions and flocks of birds have been feasting. It was just this, so many fish, like 
more fish than my mind could ever imagine. It was crazy. A local conservation society has been transplanting grass to promote fish spawning there for 20 years, but has no explanation why this year has belched forth a writhing Piscean mass so thick it blurs the line between nature film and horror film. And so the mind wanders. Brock said at first he thought, well, maybe it's the earthquakes that have pushed them closer to White Rock. Others say, what about the warming waters? All scientists are willing to say is that that northern anchovy seems to like BC waters a little bit more now than before. That is a national for Friday, December 27th. Good night.